here. So this is going to be about some work I've been doing for the last kind of couple of years with um, some collaborators down there at the bottom uh, on adding um, what are called algebraic effects to a camel, and in particular looking at uh, some work we're going to add an effect system to a camel to kind of manage these effects and, and, and more. So, so a good place to start. Um, we're going to talk about algebraic effects. Let's talk about like, effects and what they are. So side effects are the the like observable effects of running a computation other than its return value. Right? Like so, you have a function, it takes some input, returns an output. Anything else about it that you can observe, that's basically a side effect. And what algebraic effects are, so they're essentially they're a mathematical approach to um, dealing with like the semantics of side effects. Um, where essentially you have to think about effects as um, a set of effectful operations that kind of interact with the, con the debt context. So I can give like mathematically a completely inadequate description, but hopefully a, like, a kind of intuition for what we mean by algebraic effects. So let's say we've got some effectful operations that we're trying to execute. Oh, I should start with like how many people like recognize a camel syntax? So I should probably be a lot, but not everyone. I'll try and like point out what bits mean what. Um, so yeah, so look, this is some little. We got some little bit of code here that's going to uh, kind of perform this like get effectful operation and then like <coughs> set the result. The idea here is that we've kind of got like maybe a single piece of integer state that we're modifying. So we're going to get its value and then add one to it and set that value to be our value of our state. So how might we kind of think about how this executes? Well, the kind of algebraic effects way of thinking about it would be to say that we kind of pause the execution. So when we get to this get statement, we're going to go and like pause the execution. So my question marks are like we're here, and then we're going to go out out to the kind of the context, the environment that's running the computation up, and say, could you perform a get operation for me? And that's going to go away and do something useful. And then when it's got a result, it's, it, we can resume the continue uh, resume the um, computation with the result. In this case, five. Um, yeah, carry on going. So, so we're thinking of effects this way. Uh, we can separate the kind of the specification of how we execute kind of pure computations from the, like, the specification of, of <coughs> what each effectful operation actually does. Right? Like you can talk about what this is doing without actually getting involved in what, how get and set are actually going to operate. Um, and that's so that's all well and good in terms of trying to define the semantics of. Um, Side effects. Uh, how is it useful for like everyday programming? Why is that going to be useful for us today? And essentially, what we're looking to do, and what we're going to use the algebraic effects for, is for defining new side effectful um, operations that aren't supported by the language. So um, that you're that you're in. So why might you want to do that? So you could be in some language where functions na have natively no side effects. So that would be like Coq or Agda or something, or where they have very few side effects like Haskell. And you might want to be trying to, you know, just use some state in your in your function, even though you're, even though there's no support for state in those <coughs> languages. Or you might be in a language like a camel, which has all the ordinary side effects that you'd expect to find. So it's got it's got some state, it's got um, you know, interactions with the with the operating system, it's got exceptions. But maybe there's some other side effects, something maybe a little more exotic that you're interested in, in, in using. And so you want to be able to implement, the, like you want to be able to write your computations as if a camel could do this side effect and then describe how to implement it in terms of a camel. And in particular, the side effect that we we're interested in that kind of motivated us to kind of look at this in the first place is, is concurrency. So here I have a kind of concurrent computation in some camel syntax and using the algebraic effect syntax. So, right, yes, so a camel syntax first. Um, this is a fun we're defining a function foo, a recursive function foo here, taking two parameters, id and depth. And basically, if the depth is greater than zero, we're going to print some statement. And then this here is the algebraic effect <coughs> bit. So then we're going to ask our context, we're going to ask the the context in which we execute, if it could perform a fork operation for us. So in kind of concurrency terms, that's like, we want you to fork off this thread to run concurrently with what we're doing. 
Um, yeah, and then, then we're going to print some other statement, uh, then fork a second thread. Um, and in the other case, when, when depth is zero, we're just going to print some statement, and then again, another algebraic effect, we're going to ask the environment if it, could, if it could yield for us. So if you've got two computations running side by side concurrently, yield is saying, oh, you know, go and let the other guy have a go for a bit. Um, yes, so that's kind of like what you would write in terms of algebraic effects. The important thing is how, how you can then uh, run such a function. So what you need to define, you're going to run some concurrent functions, you need to find like a scheduler. So and this is what's called a, an effect handler. So these, this is here we're performing some effects, and in this, in this, in this part here we're going to be um, handling them. So I should just, well, I should run that there again. So yes. so yes, this function takes two integers and returns a unit. Um, now, in the scheduler, the important part, the like algebraic effect part, is this these two cases down here. So. This is a very simple scheduler. We've just kind of got a queue that's like our queue of things to do. And we're going to uh, push things onto it and then pop things off when we want to, something new to do. Um, I should say, I suppose, this, this match with, I don't know, most people are going to be familiar with the pattern matching syntax. So you know, it's, saying, it's saying run f and then like compare the result with, with this. Um, but yes, as I said, the important part is going to be these two down here, this effect yield and this effect fork. And this is telling us how to, um, how we're going to implement fork and yield when running f. So schedule's going to take in f and it's going to run it. And if f performs a yield effect, what we're going to do is, we're going to, so what we get is both, we have the effect yield and we have this k. And this k is a continuation. So it's representing the computation we were running when, you know, the computation that performed yield. Like if I go back to our little view, it's like this, it's like this thing boxed up. We, we've got this computation, it's waiting for some value. We've wrapped it up as a continuation, and then we've jumped down to here. And so what we're going to do when something yields, well, we're going to push that continuation onto the queue of things to do, and then we're going to pop something else off the run queue and do that instead. So you can see how that's implementing kind of yielding behavior. And if someone tries to, uh, uh, someone wants to perform a fork effect in F, what that's going to do is we're going to take the continuation, take what we're currently doing, stick that on the queue, and then we're going to kind of recursively go back around and run f with its effects also handled. Oh, I should, I should possibly also say this is it's intended to be more like a demo than a, a, a lecture, so feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, right, let's so if I run that, we get, uh, oh, it's a bit low down here. So that's a function from, you know, takes a, takes a function as input from unit to unit and returns another, uh, returns a unit value. And if we, oops, okay. and if we run this, uh, so if we, if we schedule a call to foo um, down to depth three, it will, um, you know, execute all those print statements and you can see that they've, they've become interleaved. Um, so it kind of you know forks some things and yields and then forks some more and yields and so on. Uh, down for I think quite a long way out off the end of the screen. Okay. All right. Anyway, so that's how you would implement like concurrency in terms of these algebraic effects, in terms of this idea of performing things and then handling things. And um, some of you might recognise this this kind of this kind of uh, perform and handle. Um, idiom from something uh, which is common in a lot of languages and is already handled in that way, and that's exceptions. So you can think of perform like raise, and you can think of the, the uh, effect handler like just an exception handler. And in fact, in terms of runtime semantics, you can just think of algebraic effects as, as resumable exceptions, basically. Um, so, you know, it, it, yeah, so there's some example using exceptions, so you define some function. This is going to, this is a function that's going to. Uh, go through a list looking for some element that satisfies the predicate p, and if it can't find one, then oops, um, where did I go? There we go. If it can't find one, then um, it uh, raises um, not found, and, and you can use that by just you know you can just run it, and um, yeah. So here we're looking for an even number in the list one three four, and then we add two to the result. 
Um, and of course, a, like a downside of exceptions, which we'll kind of come to later, is that if you um, if there is no even number, then we get this kind of unhandled exception. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that uh, later on. Right, so um, yeah, here we had uh, computation that forms the, or raises the not found exception. How are you supposed to use that? Well, most languages provide you with a, a kind of try with construct. That's kind of the normal thing you get. So, um, uh, so you you know you execute this uh, this code, and if it, <coughs> if, if it raises not found, well, then we just return none. Whereas if it completes, we'll, we'll be returning some. Um, yeah. um, but uh, Camel already provides a syntax that's much closer to the effect handling one, so you can see the similarity more clearly. Um, where here we're kind of uh, going to match on this computation, and if it performs an exception, the exception not found will return none, and if it completes successfully, will return some one plus two. And um, the reason we use this uh, this lower one for effect handles mostly is, is, is it, it's it's uh, it's much more precise than this other one. So uh, if God forbid someone that changes plus to raise not found um, for some reason. Uh, in this first example, if it raise not found, it would get caught here, which is clearly not what we meant. Whereas in the second one, the, the, the plus is outside the scope of the of the handler. So that's kind of why you, you go for this, this match style. Uh, this is a better way to write handlers in general. Right, so um, a couple more examples of um, Implementing effects using using implementing side effects using algebraic effects. So this one is going to be a generator, um, like concurrency. This is this is one that, that a lot of languages have recently kind of been adding native support for. Um, but again, like, rather than coming up with some native support for generators, if you, if you just have algebraic effects, then you can just let the user implement generators um, however they they want to. So this function here, we have an evens function. Oh, sorry, sits up with a generator is. Um, so, <coughs> generator. So, a lot of, some people would describe a generator as a function that kind of returns multiple times over and over again. Uh, for the purposes of this, I would think of a generator more as a function that you know, takes a value, it returns a value, but as a side effect, it produces some stream of values. Um, and so, uh, from that perspective, uh, you can see how this function is a generator. So, we have um, it's going to uh, we have some reference that's kind of the current count. We have this infinite loop that's going round, incrementing the reference. And if the if the number is, is even, then we're going to perform some return effect. So this is just kind of returning a value uh, to our context. Um, yes. And so uh, in order to run something like that, to run a generator written in that style, you need, again, you need an effect handler. Uh, so this effect handler is just uh, going to we, this total function. It's going to take some some number, take some generator function, and it's going to uh, add up the total of, of, of all the things returned of the, of the first n things returned by that generator. So you can see you've got this kind of count, which is a you know, <coughs> mutable reference containing an integer, and total another mutable reference containing an integer. And then we're going to run f. And if f returns normally, uh, then we'll just return the total that we've, we've counted up so far. And if f performs a return effect, what we're going to do is well, we'll, we'll add x, <coughs> add the x that it returns to the total. We'll increment the count by one. And uh, if the count is bigger than n, so that we're finished, we'll just return the total. Otherwise, we will continue the, the uh, we will resume the computation but with this continue function here. That's resuming the continuation. And uh, yes, so there's a call down there to, to ask for the, the total of the first five even numbers, which hopefully is 20. Um, yeah, and so you can see how that's, that's worked. Question. Yep. The first branch of that match, will it, will it ever match? First. Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, so the question was, will that first case in the match ever match? And um, so in the, not for this call we've got here with evens, because evens is going to Producing an infinite stream, but if you were produce, if you, if I, um, hang on, let's just um, pop back to evens. So, um, what just happened there? Um, so, if we say, what is going on? Sorry, my keyboard is being weird. Oh, 
Are you holding down alt? No, no. Apparently, spacebar is it's going to the new to the new slide, which it wasn't doing before. Don't know how to manage that. Well, anyway. So if I changed, um, right. if I changed, uh, if the flow control X is at the bottom, it'll do it. It'll take that branch. Yeah. So it, it, yeah, if it was only while X was bigger than one, then the, then it would have taken that branch. Right. And one last example of, of, of effects. We've got um, just state. Obviously, Cam already has state, so you might not want to implement it as an algebraic effect, but to kind of show kind of the completeness how you can implement basically all side effects this way. Um, we have this example. So we're going to assume here just a single, again, like, like an earlier one, like a, just a single piece of integer state that we can set with set and we can get with get. Um, and so this function here is, is computing the factorial of something, and it starts by setting the state to 1, and then um, it iterates from one, uh, from 1 to n, getting the current state, timesing it by the current index, and then setting it, setting the state to that again. And then at the end, we just um, get the result. <coughs> um, so uh, this, again, it's a, right, we have this, this computation that's performing these get and set operations. We need a handler in order to run it. And um, so here is a handler for a, a single piece of integer state. Um, Slightly more uh, tricky to get your head around than the other ones. Um, if you're familiar with the kind of the state monad, it looks basically exactly the same. But um, so what this this handler is doing is it's kind of transforming your computation into something that takes into a function that takes an initial state and returns a value. So in our return case, this time we uh, so if f of x just returns something, well then we, we we produce a function that ignores the state and just returns the value. If f uh, of x uh, forms the um, get effect, well then we what we do is we, we continue the continuation and pass it, it pass it the current state. I should possibly explain what how continue works. So yes, so here we have um, we have continue ks. That's saying resume the computation and pass it the value s. So that's the current state. And then because what we're making is a function that takes a state, we then pass that the state as well. And uh, the state uh, the set effect uh, becomes a function that takes a state, ignores it, continues the continuation with unit as its result, uh, as its result and um, threads through the new, the new state value that you passed in. So, and we run it. We're going to we run this one by passing it 0. So our initial state is going to just always be 0. As I say, it's a little tricky to get your head around that one, but it's a fairly standard construction. Um, and if I run it, it does successfully produce, yep, a factorial of 5, which is good. So anyway, that's a load of examples of, of why you might want to have algebraic effects, or how you can use them to implement side effects that maybe your language doesn't support. Um, a quick note, I guess, on the implementation, like of how roughly how they're, like, at runtime, what are they actually doing? So here's the kind of, like, here's our standard like effect handler. We've got this, we're going to match on some body. There's a return case. There's a handler. And essentially, whenever you enter um, the body of an effect handler, you're creating a, a fresh call stack, right? So you know, we know, we know when you run a program, you're running it on a call stack that's tracking uh, the return addresses of functions you've called. So when you go into a handler, you're creating a, a fresh stack. And these stacks are um, they're heap allocated and they're dynamically resized. So we start with a very small one, and if you call you know, a few functions, then it'll grow. Maybe call some more, it'll grow up to the whatever size you need. Um, and then when we perform an effect, what we do is we kind of we take that stack that we've made, we wrap it up as a continuation, we jump back to the previous stack, and we run the handler there, and we can pass it the continuation, so it executes on the on the earlier stack. Um, and then when you want, when you then continue that continuation, we kind of <coughs> reinstate that stack, jump back to the top of it, and carry on where we were, where we left off. So yeah, so that's that's kind of a quick overview of how they're implemented. I don't really want to go into huge details. Does um, the, sorry, yeah. does the um, so presumably this continuation has a type. Does that type involve only the value that we pass to the continuation to resume it, or does it also include the type of value that 
will eventually be returned by the handler. It has but three, in fact. It's got the so you have it has the it's it's got the input type that you're passing the continuation, the return type, which is the type of the outer body, and it's also got the effect that might be performed by the by the thing as well. Um, oh, hold on. I haven't got that far. We're going to track types. It affects the type system later. Um, yes. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's that's roughly how they're implemented. So so far it's all good and it's working quite well. But as I hinted at earlier, there is a kind of obvious downside with this approach of having these these uh, these um, algebraic effects, uh, and that's that the, uh, the, if you define your uh, effects as like operations that interact with that with their context, you you know you're clearly running the risk of trying to execute them in a context which doesn't know how to execute those operations, right? Like that's um, clearly a problem and. In the like in the degenerate case, in the exception case, it's a very familiar problem for anyone who's ever used Java in particular, uh, or, um, and that is um, the not found ex yeah, exception, you know, uh, an unhandled exception, basically. So you, you've tried to you've run run this find this computation to find even numbers in the list one through five. It's attempted to essentially perform the effect not found, and you haven't told it what to do in that case. So your program is forced to just stop and say, I have no idea what to do. Um, and uh, yeah, at best, you'll get a backtrace. So that's obviously not ideal. The same thing happens with like more general effects. So if I try and run our evens generator without telling it how to do it, um, for technical reasons, it says the word exception. But what it's complaining about there is the fact that the return effect is, 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 is not being handled. Um, now, one way of implementing side effects in a language that doesn't suffer from this problem is monads. Um, and so, right, there, there are two slides on monads, and if you know what they are, then hopefully they will, they will be informative. And if you don't know what they are, hopefully this talk means you will never have to. So <laughs> I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> but um, fundamentally, uh, so yeah, so let's say we, this, is, this is basically our exception. This is an exception monad, um, which we could use instead of raising an exception. It's got return and bind, which do the things they should obviously do from a monadic perspective. Um, and we can use them to implement our find function. Um, so uh, yeah, you can see now it uses error instead of raising an exception. And it returns x. And here, down here, when we run the find, we have to use bind to get the result out. Um, and now the important part, point from the perspective of this talk, really, is that uh, unlike the code we were looking at earlier, unlike um, Where's find gone? Uh, unlike this find um, and this result, um, uh, hang on, I've lost the result. There we go. Uh, so if you look at the types here, there's no mention of not found anywhere, right? Like it's got no idea. We've got no idea when we look at find that not find might, might, might happen, or even here that there was a risk that it happened that we didn't see it. Whereas if you come back and look at the monadic one, um, we can see, so result is like the, the exception bit. And you can see it right here in the, um, Nope, one slide too short. There we go. Uh, oh no, right. Find them instead of find. Oh uh, yeah, I renamed it. That uh, didn't rerun it. Cool. There we go. That's better. Um, so you can see right here, uh, right, uh, right on the far right. In fact, you can see right here. You can see not found result right there in the type of find. And again, with this X, you can see not found result. So when we use the monadic approach, we get. Uh, we, we, we track the side effect in the type system, which is, you know, and therefore prevent this, this problem of having unhandled effects. But we don't, and, and that's, that's good, but monads are, um, have some problems compared to algebraic effects that we, we'd quite like to avoid, um, some, some disadvantages at least. So one is that when you have, when you use monads, you kind of split the world into two things. You kind of say like there are, there are pure functions and they run, and then there are these functions that perform computations and then they're very separate, and you tend to end up for higher order functions. You tend to end up with two copies. You have like a this map which tells you how to map a pure function over a list, and then this map which tells you how to map a function that does effects over a list. And really, there's there's no need for either. I'm not for either for both. Um, uh, now you can you can use the identity monad to try and just get away with map m, but then you're just forced to use monads like just everywhere in every type signature, and it's kind of annoying. Um, so that's not ideal. Uh, monads are also kind of not, uh, it's awkward to use two monads at once sometimes. Um, uh, in the same expression, you can use monad transformers to try and build up a monad, or you can 
mint a fresh monad, neither of which is, is, is really what you want to do. Um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of fiddly, annoying boilerplate with monad transformers. And it's just, that's frustrating. And then there's the performance aspect as well. So unlike with those effects where we just have these stacks with running code as normal here, if you look at, um, I'll delete one example, so I can't look at that example. Um, but essentially, that you're, you're creating a lot of intermediate data structures as you go through this computation, and you're also creating a lot of closures as you go through this computation. And to get back to good performance, you're going to rely pretty heavily on your uh, optimizer, and especially your inliner. And that's not, you, know, you don't really want to have to do that if you can avoid it. Like inlining is a, it's always heuristic-based. It's always going to be a little fragile. Uh, it takes away from the predictability of your performance. So we'd like, we'd rather not just use monads. We'd like to use the algebraic effects. So what we want to do is we want to solve that problem of having these unhandled effects. Um, yes. Um, and so how might we do that? The um, well, there's a kind of uh, fairly large body of work on like the idea of trying to track effects in the type system um, under what are called effect systems quite a bit of variety, but they all look like this if you're familiar with type systems somewhere else. I'll move on to an easier description in a second. Um, but fundamentally what we're going to do is like we're going to say that, that every expression not only has a type, but it has some effect. So you're going to track both. And um, we're going to attach <coughs> these effects uh, to the types of functions. So um, in a kind of more uh, layman friendly presentation. Um, Essentially, something like perform get hello plus one. It has the type int, but it also has the effect get string to int, right? And uh, and then what we're going to do is we take that expression and we wrap it in a function we've got here. Then we're going to get a type that looks something like this. So uh, what we've got now is now f is a function that takes uh, a unit parameter returns an int, and at the same time, it, it performs the effect get that goes from string to int. Right. Um, I should say these are, these are uh, structural effects, so it can perform get if it likes instead. Um, we don't need to define them anywhere. They're just kind of, uh, the label is, is, is sufficient. Um, yes, yeah, so these, these effect descriptions that we've got between these kind of two uh, square brackets, I'm going to say a li little bit about them. So essentially what these effect types are doing, are they're, they're telling you um, that they're a description of the stack of handlers that need to be in your context to run this function safely. Um, so they're a, they're a list of effects, basically. Um, but you can, you can permute the order between effects of different labels, doesn't matter, so you can permute them. If you want to run in a context that supports both get and set, it doesn't matter which way around you write them, so those, those are the same. But if you were in a context which, and it can happen, <coughs> get of int and then get of string, then you can't permute them. So you, you need to have a handle that handles get of int, and then outside that, a handle that handles get of string. So, yeah, so they're kind of like uh, lists, but where the order can be permuted if the labels don't match. That's, so that's the kind of, uh, in the type system, what they, what they are. And obviously, it's always going to be, it's basically always going to be safe to. Uh, ask for more effects. So you could always, a function that, that uh, only requires there to be a handler for get doesn't care if there's also a handler for set. Like that's not a problem. So you can kind of always subtype these to have a larger, uh, larger effect descriptions. So now we can look at some like examples with the uh, with these types. So this is the head function. So this is just trying to um, uh, take the first item off a list. So we have again a pattern match. I think this might be the first proper pattern match in the whole uh, talk. So basically, head takes a list, and if it's the empty list, it's going to uh, throw empty. It, otherwise, it's going to return the first item. Uh, this throw is, is essentially this is like raise. Uh, so we we're going to leave the normal raise there in the language for use for things like uh, uh, programming errors, which you, you know, which really should kill your program, uh, and add an additional kind of ability to have these kind of tracked exceptions. Um, something which has made a bit of a kind of dirty work by Java's terrible attempt to do check checked exceptions, but there, that's, that's essentially what we have here. And so you can see in the type of head, we can now, it's now very clear that, that, that head uh, takes a list, uh, takes an alpha list, returns an alpha, and potentially it raises, um, it's gonna, potentially gonna throw this empty thing. So we can see in the type that this case needs to be handled. And indeed, if we try and run head, um, 
I don't really actually just make it clearer doing that. If we try and run ahead at the top level, um, the type system's not going to let us. It's just going to say that this binding performs an unhandled effect empty. And if we want to use it, we're actually going to have to um, um, see if that's going to. Why has that started happening? That's very frustrating. Um, uh, right, well, I can't change that for that thing now. Never mind. Um, if we surrounded that in a handler, then it would be fine and it would run. Uh, yeah, and so we can we can return to our evens example, our generator, and, and again uh, look at the type. And so now it's pretty clear, rather than being unit to unit, um, which is a pretty worrying type for something that does so much work, um, it now has uh, you know, unit to unit, and it returns int and expects unit in, uh, in return. And again, just like with the uh, throw case, just like the exception effect, um, we will get an error message if we try and run this in a context which doesn't know how to deal with return. So that's, yes, and then the last part that we need in order to type check things with, with effects is, is effect variables. So basically we, we've, we've got a way of describing now the fact that some function expects some things to be, you know, some effects to be handled. We also need to be able to describe how higher order functions, kind of how the effects flow between them. So, um, so yeah, here I've got list, the type for list.map and essentially what you, what you want to be able to say is that if the function you pass list.map performs some effect, then running list.map is also going to perform that effect. And that's, that's what, so what we've got here is this, um, so here uh, we've got this e, um, and that's an effect variable. It's very much like this a here, which is a type variable in a camel. It's just, um, just an effect rather than a type, so it's a different kind. Uh, and it just represents that, that for, any, for any, effect, any effect that this function might perform, is also going to come out here. So that's what effect variables are for. Now, um, in practice, the vast majority of functions uh, behave in a very similar way in this, uh, when it comes to this. Like you take in, so I mean, either they're not higher order and they take in no functions and then maybe they perform some effects, or they're a higher order function, so they take in some functions as input, and then at the very end, they just perform all the effects that came from all the functions. This is normally what you do, right? It's very, you, you could have something that didn't do that. You might take one function in, take another function in, wait for one more argument, right, call the first function, wait for another argument, call the second. But it's very rare. So in the vast majority of cases, you, you only need the one effect variable. Like that's just the effects that are going to happen at the end. Um, and so with a bit of syntactic sugar, we can make our map type much more easy to deal with. So, so Essentially now, we've replaced this, um, this bang E by just a tilde on our arrow. And that just represents us having, there's just a special uh, effect variable called bang tilde, and this is just shorthand for that. And you can basically write all your, uh, all your function types with just the, just the tilde arrow and the straight arrow if they're not using any uh, effects. So that makes things nice and succinct and pretty easy to use. I think fairly easy to comprehend as well. You can just see that you know, that takes a function that does some effects and then does those effects itself. Is that the same as the function being pure, or is this the same as the function being pure? Um, depends. It's kind of hard to talk about. Like, I would say the map is pure because it doesn't do any effects, but obviously it runs a function. So if that function is not pure, then map isn't pure either. Like, it's polymorphic in its purity essentially. Um, yes. So this, so this is effect polymorphism we have here. Uh, right. So uh, I thought I would try not toy de um, demonstrations because uh, it's always nice to see some, some larger code. So what I've done is I've taken, so um, my, my colleague in London, Jeremy um, Dominio, has written a build system. Um, if you're in the account community, you probably use it. It's called Dune. And it has its own concurrency library because it tries to be low, like tries to not have many dependencies. So it doesn't want to use like async or LWT. Um, so what I've done is I, I've taken that, that library and I've t you know, converted it to use effects. Um, so you have a little look at the kind of monadic interface for the original library. So you have like, what does he call them again? Fibers, yes. So he has a fiber type, an alpha t, alpha t which is your type of fibers, and that's a computation that, that does you know, some concurrent effects. Mm -hmm. uh, he has the usual monadic stuff of having return and bind and map, but we don't really care about that. Uh, the important things that he has are really these uh, these two functions uh, here, fork and wait. 
So fork is going to um, take a, a, a unit to alpha t, so that's going to be something that, um, it's a computation that returns an alpha, a, a concurrent computation returning an alpha. So it takes one of those in and it gives you a, a future, an alpha future t. So basically you're going to fork off this thread and get given back this future. And then later on you can call future.wait, which will basically pause your thread until the other one is finished and give you the value that it returned. So that's kind of the, the, the two functions at the core of this library. Um, so yeah, so we have here fork here and, and wait. Um, yes. Uh, and then there's yeah, let's see, a variety of other ways to fork. Um, some manic stuff you don't really need. Some more ways to fork. There are many ways to fork in this library. Uh, it's also got some weird variable stuff that I, it's like a reader monad that I don't want to talk about. Some error handling I also don't want to talk about. Um, and then he's got uh, mutexes at the bottom and, um, and ivars, which are, uh, again, I hope, but they're like mutexes. They're a kind of a way to um, control um, concurrency. And finally, he's got yield, which is also a useful one in a, um, for uh, cooperative concurrency. So this is, and this you know, takes a unit and returns you a unit computation that will, uh, like the yield in our earlier scheduler, will switch you off to some other thread. And then this um, run function, which is what's going to actually execute your uh, your concurrent uh, computation. So it takes a, an alpha t, it takes a concurrent computation returning some type alpha, and then returns you the value that you get from running it. So when we turn that into, uh, we kind of use effects instead, the interface starts to look like this instead. So we have this <coughs> effect async. I, I'll, I'll talk about its definition in a moment. Um, and now, uh, now the fork function, rather than, you know, rather than having this computation type t, we just have our fork function just takes a function that goes from unit to alpha doing asynchronous things, and uh, then it does asynchronous things itself and gives you an alpha future dot t. Uh, and wait is just a function that takes a, um, a future, uh, an alpha future, does some asynchronous effects, and returns an alpha. And basically going down the going down the API, the changes are all basically of that nature. We take away all the T's and we put async effects into the right places. Um, yeah, like you can see uh, yield, for example, is now a unit to unit function that does async. And the run function is now something which takes uh, it takes an alpha to beta function doing asynchronous effects and turns it into an alpha beta function that doesn't do asynchronous effects. So. Can you make the font a bit bigger? The font a bit uh, yes, I can. Sorry. Uh, I probably can, hang on, uh, yeah, text. Yeah, probably one more. Yeah. One more. Okay, there we go, sorry about that. Was any of that followable, seeing as probably no one could read what I was pointing at? No? Never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, right. Where was I? Run, yeah, so run is now going for an A to B Performing async turns it into an A to B that doesn't perform async. So you can see that, like, an effect handler is it's a very obvious type. It just like removes the effect from the type of a function. That's our scheduler. Um, and yeah, uh, in terms of the implementation, I yeah definitely don't have time to go into the implementation in any detail because it's well, quite long, if nothing else, and quite complicated. Um, although it was complicated before I started playing with it, I didn't add the complexity. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but I did want to show roughly what I was doing with the definition of ace, the asynchronous effect. Oh, by the way, this statement here is just defining a new effect. So it's just defining an alias for this thing on the right. So these, basically I've got this big op type, and this is all my asynchronous operations. And basically I decided rather than to have, a, uh, put them all as separate effects, to just have one effect, and then a GADT decide between the operations. Um, so, but you can just think of it as a giant effect, uh, a giant effect type here, but there's a lot of different things in it, because there's a lot of different things this library does that are concurrent. Um, you could probably get away with about three if you were to sacrifice with performance, but uh, anyway. Um, oh yeah, and the reason that I've done it as this kind of op type separate from the effect was so that in the interface I could make this abstract. So I've, I've hidden from you what actual operations I'm doing, and as far as you're concerned, I'm doing some abstract set of operations, um, all labeled with async. And that's kind of basically just a design decision. You can kind of choose between exposing things and therefore making your computations kind of more extensible, like they could be run by some other scheduler, for instance, if I've made them all explicit. Or I can 
use abstraction like that here to hide them, mostly because I've got loads of them and the, uh, the design is kind of unsettled, so I didn't really want to let everyone know what's going on. Um, and then break their code when I changed it later. So anyway, so that's that's kind of, um, I've done that. And the yeah, the more interesting thing really is how it feels like to use it. Um, it's going to be really annoying that I can't type space. Um, I'll just copy a space character. I, yeah, I will totally do that when I have to now. Um, <laughs> it was working fine earlier. I have no idea. Uh, anyway, um, so here I've got, what have I got here? Ah, yeah, so here's just a simple concurrent program uh, using the Monadic library, the Monadic ver version of the library. Um, it's a nonsense program. It's hard to come up with small examples that aren't nonsense. Uh, what is it going to do? Oh, yeah, so I have this say function that's going to say, it takes two strings and a number, and it's going to say both the strings a number of times, yielding between them. So you can see that it loops, um, you can see that yeah, it loops um, recursively here, where i decreases each time until zero, and it returns unit, um, and it prints things. Uh, and we have to use bind here, we use the yield, and then we make this thread, which is going to fork off something that's going to say hello world five times, and simultaneously it is going to say goodbye twice with a yield in the middle, and then it's going to wait on the other one, so it's going to wait until the hello world is finished before finally printing done. So that's what the code looks like, uh, kind of with the old library. Um, and am I going to run it? I am going to run it. Uh, and it does what it should. Hello, goodbye world, hello, yeah. And then it stops saying goodbye, it just says hello world until done. Um, here is the code with the effect uh, using the effect based version, and basically all the binds and returns have gone. That's pretty much the, the, the thing. It's, it's very, I think, uh, quite satisfying to be able to just write uh, things in direct style rather than in monadic style. Uh, obviously, you can use do notation to try and tidy up monadic style, but really it's just nice to use semicolon for things. Um, so, yeah, so here this time, rather than as we were having to perform yield and then bind on it and create a closure. We just uh, we just perform the yield just run the yield function, and down here we just uh, rather than binding on fork we just call fork and let find it uh, as a feature which we then use down here to wait on it, um, which is all uh, I think very good and you can see in the types that we've now got this. Um, unfortunately, my type printer is not great. I need to improve it. So it should just say async, but it's expanded it out because uh, I haven't paid much attention to fixing that. But anyway, you can see that say is going to take two strings of an int do some asynchronous stuff and return a unit, and our thread function takes a unit, does some asynchronous stuff, and returns a unit. And, uh, and yeah, it also, hopefully, yep, does the right thing uh, when executed. Um, now, to some specific advantages of using, of like switching our monadic thing over to some, uh, over to use algebraic effects for our concurrency. Um, so the first is that it, it um, interacts well with higher order functions. So let's say I had, um, a list of strings, in this case the numbers one to five, and I just wanted to fork off a thread for each of those each of those strings. So with the effects thing, all I have to do is just list.map over the strings and run fiber.fork um, inside it to fork off this thread. Whereas uh, if it was monadic, I'd have to use mapm, or in a camel, I'd even more likely have to have something called future uh, fiber.list.map and use that instead and you know, create these extra functions that we don't really want to have. Um, but yeah, here I can just use a list.map, it's fine. And similarly here, when, once I've made this list of futures uh, that are saying uh, a lot of numbers, I can uh, just, I can wait on them all by just iterating a call to wait over all of them. Um, oh, there we go, that runs and just says a lot of numbers. Uh, I think the examples are getting silly as I go along. Um, so, I think I was running out of ideas. Um, right, right, and we have, um, and here's another one. I think this one's vaguely plausible. <laughs> so this this function is discerned. So we've got some list of feature, of, it's like an associative list, but each one of them is a feature because it hasn't finished yet. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna try and find you the, the thing right in the associative list with the right key but it's only going to like wait on the features that it needs to as it iterates down the list. That's what this function does. Um, and what this is demonstrating is that we can easily mix 
two different effects together. Um, so this function, obviously, because it's quite possible that you're looking for a key that isn't in your list, it throws one of our effect exceptions when it, when it can't find one. Um, and it also is going to be using future.wait to wait on things. Um, and if we kind of uh, type check that, we can see that, that it indeed does perform two effects. So it takes a B, a B, C, fiber future list thing, and then it performs async operations and not found returns pool. And so again, if we, if we were dealing with monads, we'd either have to have created our own uh, fiber plus error case um, monad uh, question. Yeah. Um, how come not found doesn't have a, a type associated for the, for the effect? Oh, yeah, that's, that's because it's an exception one. You see, I used throw instead of perform, so it can't come back, so there's no return type, and then I didn't give it any arguments, so there's no argument type, so it ends up just being like just like that, basically. That's all. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so if you use throw, it is, like, it is impossible for it to be resumed, so there's no need to talk about what type it was at. I see. Which is, um, we distinguish the most HTML from performance because you can, uh, exceptions can run much faster than, than the non exception ones because you don't have to keep the stack lying around. So they kind of split into two separate things. Uh, yeah, as I was saying, with the, if you were doing this monadic, you'd have to create some, um, yeah, a fiber, uh, fiber plus error monad, or you'd have to make fiber into a monad transformer, make your error into a monad transformer, and then define it with the assuming it's has to then define the instances that do the lifting across the two of them. That's quite a lot of boilerplate that I don't want to do, I just want to write this. Or something useful that looks like this. Um, right. Okay. Short. Um, so, <clears throat> that's kind of all of the kind of, we've got now this, this type system that, that tracks all our algebraic effects. We can use algebraic effects to implement new, new effects in, in our language of choice, um, which, because of where we are, is, is a camel. Um, uh, but we, you know, could we go a bit further than that and try and deal with, like, what about essentially the effects that, that the effects that a camel supports natively? Like, a camel already has all these mm -hmm. other effects. Um, could we, in, like, could we just track those in the type system as well? Um, it's nice to know when things are when functions are pure, even if they could run in any context. We've got we've got this effect system. It's successfully keeping track of the algebraic effects, so we can use those for implementing new effects in our in our language. Um, but since we have an effect system, what about tracking the effects that a camel already does? Like a camel already has support for for state and, and I/O and things like that. And it might be nice to know when functions were pure and when they weren't, because if you um, Pure functions are, are easier to reason about, right? Their behavior uh, is constrained in more ways so that you can uh, you have to think less about them and so on. Um, so could we use the effects to track those? And like, how we're gonna look at that question is, is we're gonna think about, well, could we just, could we implement the, the effects that a camera already has as algebraic effects? Um, so here is, um, I think we saw this function before. This is our factorial function, but this time it's just using the camel's kind of normal references. Um, so it, it, it oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it um, creates a reference cell with a one in it, uh, iterates between one and n, uh, getting the value out of the reference cell, timesing it by the current index, and setting it back into the reference. And yeah, so it's like that. Um, so we could instead replace this. Um, this, these uses of the, of the references in a camel that provide a state with some algebraic effects. So we could uh, replace the allocation by calling some, performing some new effect, um, and then which would give us a reference R, which we would then pass to a get effect, and again to a set effect. Um, yeah. Uh, so what we need to, in order to try and run a camel's state effects is, 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 a, uh, is some handler that will uh, work for those operations. So here we have a kind of, um, it's just a kind of generalized version of the state one we saw earlier, really. Except now, rather than just having a single piece of integer state, we've got this map from um, our keys, the references, to, uh, to the, the value that's stored in them. Um, so you can see that, yeah, if, we, if the function f that we're trying to, if the computation returns, then we just get something that takes a store and ignores it and returns the value. If it performs this new effect, we want to create a new reference. Well, we, um, we basically we add um, with some value v. We get well. We add the key, which we get using the integers as keys. We, we add 
the new reference location into our, into our store, set to the value, the, the value we were passed, and we increment like this counter on the right, which is our counter of like, what's the next free reference? Um, and then when you get, you've got this location, you've got this reference, which is just an integer that you can look up in your store. So we use that to look up the value that's stored at that cell. Um, and carry on. And uh, in the set case, we, we again, we, we, we get given a reference location. It's just this integer into our, into our map. And we use it to set, these, set the, the value of that reference. And then we start the computation with an empty store, and uh, zero is the next free reference number for the original store. Um, and, and this will uh, indeed run our function. Uh, oh, it's got some type that I can't quite see. So yes, yeah, so it takes. Uh, so you can see int is being used as our reference type. You get like an int, set takes an int to the b and gives you a unit. Get takes an int to uh, to a b and new takes a b. Uh, and oh no, no, no well, and returns a C. Uh, um, so yeah, and if we run our factorial function with this handler. It does indeed work correctly. So we can clearly kind of um, uh, we could implement the camel's built-in references by just like using our direct effect. Um, the only like subtlety here is that we have to be very careful. We want to make sure that, that the, the references that we pass here have always come from from new, right? We don't want like some other. Reference. So if we had two of these handlers, we'd have to make sure that their references didn't cross over. But uh, in a camel, you could obviously just say, well, there's just one giant handler inside the entire program that deals with all of them, and all the references come from this handler, and all the, and all the, and all the gets go to that handler. So we, we'll, be, we'll be sure that this find operation here is not trying to look up some integer that we haven't already put in. Would you actually want to implement references, in, or mutable references at a camel like that? Would you? Uh, no, no, not even slightly. It's going to be horribly inefficient. I mean, when you compare it to just setting some memory, it's that's difficult to compete with in terms of like performance. Um, so, um, but uh, the point is that we could, and we better, and 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 we'll use that in a second for a useful thing. Um, uh, yes, in fact, and we'll just I/O we do the same thing with I/O. So we could um, we could here's some an I/O function that's going to open this talk, read bytes. What is it like nine? To uh, nine to eighteen, and then some other bytes um, from twenty-seven to something else, which are in fact the title of the talk taken from the top. And so, yeah, so it's using seek and open and input to, to just read value from the file. And it's not clear, and we, so we could indeed picture this as being all of those operations as just being out direct effects. Now, it's not clear how you would write a handler that does them, but you can certainly pretend that your interpreter has some handler in it that knows how to do this, right? Um, so you could um, so you can just you can just treat all of these calls as as, as performing effects that are being dealt with by the runtime as some handler around your whole program. And so, and when I say you could say that uh, you know you could you could think of it this way, the point is you can't tell that it's not what's happening. Like you can't observe that this isn't how a camel is implementing your side effects. So what we'll do is we'll just type check it like this is happening, and implement it the fast way. Um, and how would that look? Um, well, I'm not going to also. I'm not going to quite type check it exactly like this. I'm going to abstract it a bit and hide precisely which effect it is a camel knows how to deal with. I'm just going to say that there's all these effects like new and get and what they have from the other one, like open and things. And I'm just going to say, well, we're just going to call them all IO. And I'm not going to tell you what they are so that a camel can freely add new ones and remove them without us all getting upset and ruining the types of our programs. But yeah, we're just going to have this single IO effect um, that represents all of those algebraic effects that we're pretending a camel supports natively. And, um, and so now our print end line function from the example before is now not a function from string to unit, it's a function from string to unit that performs the IO effect. And um, now obviously it's not going to be very backwards compatible if I try and make everyone write the word IO all over their existing code, but with a bit of syntactic sugar, um, we can keep things all backwards compatible. I appreciate mention all of this so far and to throughout the entire talk is backwards compatible with current account. Um, so yeah, so now our impure functions, they stay as string arrow unit, because that arrow can't, we can't change them, what that arrow means. And what that arrow means right now is function that performs the camel's built-in side effects. Like, that's what that arrow means. We can't change that. We leave that the same. We have a new arrow, which is function that does not perform any of the camel's built-in side effects. And that here is this little double-headed arrow uh, that we have here. Uh, and in fact, I actually have essentially a little kind of 
family of syntactic sugars now because we've got the, the arrowhead is either single or double, perhaps any whether the IO one is in there, and then the tail is either straight or a tilde, so it depends whether you've got a, a variable. And between those four arrows are enough to um, deal with, well, for a start, they're enough to type. Like you can write the types of the entire camel standard library with just those four arrows, so you don't need any others. What is the tilde double headed uh, that would be some, so that's got a variable in and no IO, and now, t and now tilde arrow is now going to be, has IO plus some other stuff, you know, plus a variable. That makes sense. I'll, I'll show you in a second. Yeah. You need to recompile the whole library with a slightly different name to, uh, to have the new types, or? Oh yeah, I had to, in fact, I'll, in like two slides, I'll just, I'll show you, like, you know, what, I, what I've done. Um, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so, so just quickly like some things that, so here are some operations on arrays and we can see that they continue to just look exactly as they did with their now uh, all impure functions like in the type system. Well, I mean, with the exception here of set, the notice that set obviously takes an array, doesn't do any effects, then takes an A and then does the effect to actually set the thing. So in fact, a lot of function types look like that, right? Like most things take some number of parameters before they do anything. So you get a lot of kind of double, you know, double, 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 and then a single one to say that at the end it does something. And then whilst list here, these are some list functions, and these all come out pure. <coughs> um, and this, uh, so yeah, so they've all got double-headed arrows now. Um, and this also uh, uh, brings up one other point. We're, we're going to adopt uh, Haskell's version of purity here. So you're allowed to raise exceptions, you're allowed to loop forever, whereas really both of those things should be treated as effects. Um, you're not allowed to handle exception. If you handle an exception, then you go into the uh, the I/O effect. But if you you can raise them, and the reason is that um, essentially it's nice to be able to assert faults in places when you know things aren't happening without changing your entire program to being impure. Um, I don't think a camel's type system is sophisticated enough to really get into the kind of proofs you'd need to do to, to make all your code come out pure when you want it to. So instead, we just say, okay, you can raise an exception. We won't track that, um, but you can't catch it. And that the idea here is between these exceptions and the kind of the exception effects, but throw and the raise is that you start using throw for like just for error handling for simple errors and raise for genuinely like this should never happen. If this happens, like the program is entirely broken. Um, so you kind of you know, things are already kind of split into those two broad categories. So now we have a um, yeah specifically two constructs for them. Right. So yes, in fact, so this is coming to like you're asking about the library. So I converted to kind of show that this is. That, that having these arrows is vaguely uh, usable. I, I converted the account standard library. Um, it's actually with a slightly earlier version of this work. But um, so the account live standard library is, uh, or was at the time, 101 files with 23,000 lines. I had to make 4,000 lines of modifications. Um, I had all the details for those in an earlier talk that I had to go through. Basically, half of them were the changes I was actually trying to make. So half of them were um, changing the type of list.map to be the type of, I think, the list.map should have, which is you know, something that's pure and then and moves the effect. Um, about half the changes were some stupid technicality to do with printf, which I wouldn't need to do uh, if the inference was slightly better. Um, and, uh, because I don't think people are probably that familiar with how printf works in account. It is this gigantic um, like mutually recursive set of GADTs and a load of mutually recursive functions using them. And, it, what it does is very, very clever typing that builds up this, this, this arrow type that's going to be the thing you pass after the format string. And I really wanted the, the, I wanted it to be have a variable in every spot uh, so that it would, yeah, so that you could infer the things. Anyway, that turns out to require a lot of typing because code like that has got type annotations all over it, and they all needed updating. So right, so about half of the locations were that. Half of them were the thing I was actually trying to do, um, and then a few little extra things, some of which are quite, quite. Uh, interesting. So one was I had to remove a load of polymorphic comparisons because polymorphic compare. This is now very account specific, so I you know, apologize for the, the non-account people in the room. Polymorphic compare has to be treated as a side effect operation because it goes through and might read some mutable states. So you have to mark it as, as side effect, which um, means switching to a monomorphic comparison. Like if you if you do int equals int, that's now going to be side effect, and you have to say like int dot equal the two ints. But, um, that's actually really good because polymorphic compare is evil and everyone hates it. But so um, the fact that <laughs> you get a marking telling you that this horrible thing is happening is actually it's definitely a, pl a plus. Um, oh yeah, I was just going to have them here somewhere. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, and the changes that I'm talking about here are like this. So this is the this is the list module, and you can see now the you know I had to change the arrow here because the length is pure. And I want to tell people that the length, length is pure, uh, and basically everything in list is pure. And surprisingly, um, and then here we have. Itter. So itter is, 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 is it's all pure arrows, and also there's a you know 
uh, that the effects that happen here, the effects of the function you pass in, come out, you know, are performed when you run the thing, which is, you know, what you'd expect it to, to do. And the same for all the higher order ones, so they're all, um, maybe, yeah, two functions. Uh, Can you keep bigger again, sorry? Oh, sorry, yeah, I keep forgetting that this is a smaller funnel. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll just so yes. As I was saying, length is now pure with a double-headed arrow. Um, all of these ones are pure, and the other one I was showing was data, which you can now see is um, it, they're all pure arrows. But there's also it says that if, if any effect that this function does come out the other side, which is yeah what you expect. And as I said, you, you can write all of the types of the standard library with just the four arrows that I was describing. Uh, it, then there's I've got another one here, which is just to show. That's two of the arrows. We only use two of them in this one. The other two turn up in um, array. So all the array functions um, I'll go past the ones that define as external. So um, yes. Yeah, so if you init an array, you take an integer that's the size of, of the array, a function that's going to define all the elements of it, which might do some side effects, and then you perform those side effects and also do IO. So you're, you're creating. So that's how you end up with a single-headed uh, effect, a single-headed polymorphic. Uh, one, so because because creating an array is, is clearly a side effect. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what type checking is. That question on the thing? Yes. Uh, so couldn't the function argument to edit be uh, tilde double head? Um, so, uh, yeah, for the benefit of the, so the question was, couldn't the function argument to be to in it be a tilde double head? Um, if uh, it's not what you want it to be. Uh, basically, it, um, if you make that tilde double head, everything will type check. But what will happen now is you'll, you'll be asking for two, two IOs, like you are saying. Um, when written this way, uh, you're saying that it, any, um, you're saying that the, the function might do IO and some stuff other than IO. And the result will be also IO and the stuff other than IO. If you say that it's, this function does some stuff, and this function does IO and the stuff. If the stuff contains IO, you get it twice. You see what I mean? So what you end up, in, in practice, it's very simple, which is basically, if, you, if the end one is a single-headed one, then all the other tilde ones are single-headed. If the end one is double-headed, the others are double-headed. But that's, that's um, there's like a subtlety of what you're describing there that, that, that yeah, means that you'd have to do it that way. Um, uh, right, yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, back to the slides, and I should speed up now because I've had an extra break. Right, okay, so now we are successfully marking the um, purity of our functions in our types, which is nice. Um, but if we go back to our local, this was the example that I used to motivate it, which is this factorial function. And it is correctly marked as, as being an uh, impure function because it uses state. Except is it correctly marked as being an impure function? Because this factorial function is pure. Like it's using state, but it's entirely local, right? Like it's making some state and playing around with it, and then at the end it throws it away and gives you a value. So um, it's somewhat disappointing that we've now tainted it by saying it's, it's, it's impure. Um, frankly, if it's gonna, you know, what it does in private with state is very much its own business, and it's not something we should be passing judgments on. So, um, right, so why is that the case? Because if we, we go back and think about what I was saying before about how we can pretend that a camel's effects are all being done you know, are all actually secretly algebraic effects, and we have these handlers, we have this handler here that handles the local state. Why can't we just insert one of these handlers in around the body factorial and thus handle it, and thus it would be pure, right? Like if I, if I ran the code and it was doing those algebraic effects and I put it under this handler, it would come out pure. So why you know, can we do that? And the answer is that, yes, we, we can do that. Um, the only thing we have to be careful of is that thing I was talking about earlier. We want to make sure that all the references we use with this get here, for this find, all the references for that find have to come from this new. Like we don't want, because the only way we know that they're definitely in the store at that, you know, there is something in the store at that location is because we allocated it. So if you had two of these things and references were being kind of swapped between them, you're gonna get you know, all kinds of horrible runtime errors at, at, at best, uh, like some kind of exception at worst, um, segfault basically. Um, so we don't want that. So what we need to do, so if you take the, 
This is kind of the interface of references, right? We just have a reference, <coughs> the type of mutable references of type alpha. Um, re uh, so a way to create them, a way to read them, and a way to set them. And what we want to do is, at the type level, to stop that kind of cross-pollination for those different handlers, and we want to mark the references with which handler they come from to make sure that they're all used in the right place. So what we do is we just give them a signature that looks like this. Um, so what I've done is I've just taken the reference type and I've given it another type parameter. This time, so the at are much like the bang e earlier and the comma a is just a, a variable representing a type of kind region. And these regions are just representing these imaginary handlers that we potentially have. It's fundamentally representing a portion of your program that the reference is local to. So you'll say, you know, this, the type of the reference now tells you, I am local to this part of the program. Uh, yes, so are these like Rust lifetimes? Is this like, uh, the question was, is this like Rust lifetimes? Uh, they're certain quite closely related, yes. Um, this is very much a way of tracking locality um, in a similar way to how Rust is doing it. Now, Rust is tracking the lifetime of a value, right? So uh, it wouldn't let these references escape into the outside world. Uh, what we're going to be tracking is the lifetime of the, where the value is used. So it's slightly different. You could escape this reference out into the outside world, you would just be left with something you couldn't actually run because you would have to run an effect that you weren't able to. So it's a subtly different distinction, but they're certainly very related. And there's some, uh, some work that someone I'm doing that that's yeah, pushing in that kind of direction to use this kind of for borrowing. But anyway, um, uh, right, as I was saying, so yes, we've, we've added this, this marker of where the reference is used, and now, this, now instead of the IO effect, this thing's doing the state effect, which is also marked with where it can safely be run. So, um, yeah, and, and, and as a line, final point, to get back the old reference one, we have this region here, this thing we're allowed to put in for the at r called global, and that's the region that's the whole program. So that's, you know, when I, before we had this imaginary handler that was wrapping around the entire program, that's that handler, global is that handler. And so old references are just these regioned references uh, specialized to run in the global region. So when you use that typing, and you type check factorial, we now get the factorial goes from int to int, and it does state for, there's an implicit polymorphism in a camel here, so this is saying for any region u, we could run the state. And since it's for any region, we could create a local region and just run it in that. And for that, we have some more syntax, and this is where I am going to have to start. Uh, maybe I'll just do without spaces. They're mostly not needed. <laughs> OK. No. Ah, that's all right. This is going to have to be quite careful. <laughs> um, I'm certainly not going to indent anything because. Fantastic. I assume I indented this so it didn't look stupid. Um, there, and now it's pure. So, this new construct, private do done, is just creating us a local, the equivalent of this local handler, and running the state inside of there. And if we tried to. Um, we tried to lift this reference out, so now, we're, now our function wouldn't be pure. There we go. Put it there. Um, yeah, so now this reference is, is escaping, right? So this is no longer a pure computation, because you can see it. You try and run that, and you get this error message here, which is basically, which says, oh, it slightly drifts off the edge, but you can see that it says, uh, this expression performs the effect global state, but we were expecting an expression that performed local number one state. So local number one is our little local region we've made for this private. Um, so the type of the local would escape its scope. So it's saying, yeah, you, you can't use that reference. That reference doesn't belong to the private handler. You just said we were going to use for all of our state. So yeah, this gives you the uh, yeah the ability to locally use state without it affecting your, the purity of your functions, which is very very satisfying. And for the kind of just for the account people in the room who know that reference is always actually just a, a record of the mutual contents, the syntax we use is like this. So the definition of RF is RF is a, a, a record with a mutable contents field, and we're mutating it is in the region R, and then you put the region R here, and then so then when you try and access such such a field, you automatically whoops, you automatically get uh, the appropriate effect. Uh, trying to access it, so it all just kind of works naturally. And again, still all backwards compatible, which is nice. Right, and that's the kind of like that's all the bits I wanted to show people. There's there's various interesting bits of future work. Um, I'm going to skip that one. Um, 
and uh, but I will I'll, I'll, I'll briefly so regions regions that's kind of missed by the gentleman over there um, they're actually a really just quite a general mechanism for tracking locality the combination of regions and, and region annotated effects so you can use them to solve other problems the way you care about locality in particular I quite like the file access one um, so you could tag all your files with the region that the file is open and then you uh, your read and write they perform some like file access effect that's tagged with 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 the region that it's allowed to be run in, and you just get a with file function here down here at the bottom, which um, you know because of the because the camel doesn't have higher rank polymorphism, I have to split it. But basically, it takes something that for, if, you, if you have something that for any region could uh, take a region file and do some region file access and produce you some value, um, then you can run it locally. So this this with file is going to uh, give you the file, and you can only use it in the body of that function. Any attempt to use that file externally is going to perform some effect with some uh, existentially quantified region that can't possibly be handled. So again, so you can use this kind of ability to do locality to solve those kind of problems uh, and get rid of those kind of errors. Uh, another question? Would you be able to take the fact that two files are distinct from each other? Or? Two files are distinct from each other. Um, yes, it will. It will show you that the two files, two files are distinct from each other. Although, if you use two files in the same scope, what's going to happen is you're going to unify. Basically, the type system's going to stop caring about the innermost of the two because it's, it's kind of the, of the, yeah. Basically, it'll end up unifying, so you, you'll lose some information. Um, yes, but and, you know, it keeps it as much as it needs to ensure locality is ensured, which might not be enough if you're like genuinely trying to keep track of exactly which file is which file and so on. Um, no, I haven't given that much thought, to be honest. Um, there's also more fun things you can do. You can do freezing. So I'm quite tempted and probably will split the state effect up into read and write. And <coughs> because then you can add, in addition to the global region, we can add an immutable region, which only knows how to handle read. And then, so then you can say that this thing that's with, with at R, you can say, oh, if I put the immutable in there, I get one that, that even though the type in general could be mutable, this one is not mutable. And you can also have freezing. So you, again, use a for all uh, with a particular R to um, to basically say if, if you can use this state locally in in this in this function, and then when the function's over, I'm going to give you back the value. Except now it's now it's thing is immutable. So you kind of see how that's freezing. So you can mutate the value at first, and and, and then as long as all the mutations are local, you then get back a value where reading is pure, um, because you know there are no more writes happening. So it's basically you've got this period where you can mutate the thing and then afterwards you can't mutate it. So you can express that like this. It uses higher kind of polymorphism though, which is why I've drifted into functors, um, which might make it a bit too heavy for practical use, I don't know. I haven't tried it yet. Um, and yeah, just enough room for this. Multi-handles are also something I'd like to look at in the future. They're quite fun. So here you run not one computation, you run two computations side by side, and your handler is allowed to respond to like effects from both of them at the same time. So this one here is pipe. So what we're going to do is we're going to run f, and we're going to run g. And when f says send, and g says receive, I'm just going to take the thing from f and pass it to g. And if, if uh, and then when they're both done, I'm just going to return the pair of values. And then I can just, you know, this is, these are the cases where it says send, but the other one's already done. Or the other one says, uh, is done, and the other one says receive. Which you can decide how to deal with it. But yeah, that ability to run two things side by side, I think is quite interesting. Um, question? Yeah, I was actually going to ask about multi-handlers. Um, I should probably give the caveat that I'm, I'm not uh, particularly familiar with the specifics of OCaml's type system, so sure. the answer to this uh, question might be that it's simply impossible. Uh -huh. I've wondered uh, if uh, you've considered, rather than using subtyping, um, uh, representing the set of effects uh, in a multi-handler as a, a sigma type, either through bidirectional typing, which I would uh, imagine is certainly impossible in this context, or um, there's a recent Popple paper on uh, uh, CPSing um, sigma types in a way that is type preserving. Um, so something along those lines. So, um, why would I want to do a sigma type? Hang on. Um, I just want to say that I'm actually only kind of using subtyping here. I'm mostly getting away with using row polymorphism, which is um, ah, okay. a non sub there. And uh, the inference is very much still in the realms of the principle. So we're not in the kind of, yeah. I'd be reluctant to move to kind of bidirectional type checking or anything like that. The damage to the camel is, I mean, like one of its major strengths is its inference is extremely strong. So I would. Right, you, you do give up inference for some things when you go in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to ask, you have to, we should talk about it after, because I'm going to need more than 20 seconds to decide sure. on that, because I'm not entirely sure why I would want sigma types there, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't, I just haven't come. It's not immediately obvious to me. Um, uh, oh, and the multi-handlers, uh, oh, you can also implement state in a nicer way with multi-handlers, because you can, yeah, I mean, this is just a silly example. Let's pretend I didn't put that one in. That's, we're ending on that one. Okay, um, <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, obviously, people were asking questions as we went, but if anyone have any kind of questions they want to ask at the end of that?